Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I am delighted to be joined firstly by Tony Haggerty but we have another guest just about to come in and that is young Declan McConville. Welcome to the show Declan, how are you sir? All right, gents, how are we doing? We're doing just fine and dandy. How are you doing, Dick? All right, Tony. Does that mean Paul John's joined by Ant and Dick? <laughs> well, listen, there you go. I like that because obviously one of them used to be called PJ when they were in the, the duo PJ and Duncan. If you want to go a wee bit further well, let's back. Let's get ready to rumble. That's the Is one. That what you're saying? That's the one. And today has been utterly breathtaking so far. And by the way, a Celtic state of mind have very much been in the background and the people that have been joining us and collaborating and coming into the studio have contributed to an incredible amount raised already. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the importance of St Mary's to the history of Celtic Football Club. And hopefully by the end of this show, Declan, right, because we're actually going to run this show. Um, obviously, if you, if you need to nip away a wee bit sooner, Dec, that's fine. We're going to run this show until six o'clock. Then we have an unplugged session from six and then Axon will come back on and then the final hour uh, will be going to the Unrestricted View, who are a reasonably new Celtic platform, but like all Celtic platforms, they're welcome to come on and join the charity weekend or the fundraiser. So we've been fu uh, raising funds today. We're currently sitting at 15,870 quid. Hopefully by the end of this particular show, we can break the 16 grand mark. Um, our target was 10k. Uh, so obviously we'll, we'll broke it through that. Uh, but why not head for 20? Why not try and get 20k? If we finish the day at 16 or 17,000, it's looking doable. And by the way, that just it's breathtaking. It's a breathtaking amount um, for us to have raised uh, collectively with everybody that's been involved. Now, Declan, you might be looking at the headline here thinking, <laughs> what on earth are you talking about? Well, uh, we've had so many Celtic platforms on already. Uh, we'll have many, many more coming on. Um, tomorrow so we thought we would just uh, have a wee walk down memory lane some of the stories that are going to be told will be coming from Tony and his uh, 20 odd year career of talking to footballers and probably turning every story into a Celtic story um, if you could Tony and there's a few in there but let's start I'm going to come to you Dick I know that for one so young you have a real passion in the history of Celtic Football Club talk to me about the importance of St Mary's to Celtic yeah, well, for the past number of years, I've been going to the uh, the anniversary of Mass at St Mary's. I was there at the start of November, um, and it's always a, a nice event to kind of, you know, St Mary's obviously in the shadows of Celtic Park. It's been an ever-present fixture in the shadows of Celtic Park, you know, our old ground for, for many years now. And, um, yeah, it's the spiritual home of Celtic Football Club, as much as we all go along to Celtic Park and support the team there. St Mary's is where it all begun in uh, 1887, under under brother Wolfred, so it's a very important part of Celtic history. If you're you're passing by, you know, any time you can go in for a wonder about. There's the the lovely mural that's obviously part of that Axon badge that we use at the, the very front door, and you know the spirit of Celtic's in there too. I was there, you know, only last week for for Bertie Old's funeral, joined by some football royalty and Celtic's legends, past and present, and um, yeah, it's still it's still Celtic spiritual home. You know, 130 year plus after the formation of the football club and it's very important that you know as long as there's a there's a Celtic that there is a, a St Mary's in the Calton. Yeah, absolutely uh, agree with that. Now the saddest part of this is that we're having to raise the money for St Mary's. It's always the saddest part of any kind of charity endeavour is that there is that need. But wherever there is a need, we as Celtic fans collectively are able to, to fill it and we've proved that. Uh, we only announced that it was going to be St Mary's kind of midweek uh, there's a whole lot of things you need to try and do before you can make that announcement, engaging with the, the beneficiary and making sure that before you make that announcement, everybody that needs informed has been informed, that you've met the person, that you've spoken to them, that it's all been broken down as to where the funds are going. So I think it was Wednesday or Thursday before we got the opportunity, um, although the idea and the concept have been in our mind for several months. Uh, so it just shows you the power of the Celtic fan base that we are able to be sitting here looking to break through the 16K barrier at some point during this show. We're going to be on, as I say, until six o'clock. Um, the people that have been getting involved in the comment section, thank you so much for getting involved. 
Um, you know, it's one of these things we're on for 12 hours today and tomorrow. You can, you know, tap in and out of the content. Um, it's a wee bit more varied this year. Uh, we're throwing in an unplugged session, for example. We've had an interview with, with Tony Curran that we, um, Tony Curran, who incidentally was asking for Declan McConville, that's how famous you are, Declan, <laughs> um, <laughs> who we had an interview with a few weeks ago. That was a pre recorded interview. Uh, we spoke to Jerry McCabe, who was a close friend of Tommy Burns, worked with Tommy at the Celtic Academy. So that's the kind of content we've had today already, as well as the other Celtic pods um, who have come on and done a fantastic job. So thank you uh, for the two Ryans and Kieran, uh, who were in here for just over an hour there. And I look forward to to watching that one back because we were out the front. Um, there's uh, a great atmosphere and a great vibe about a state of mind studio today because we know that we're here for the goodness uh, of the community that needs us most at this time of year as well Tony uh, Declan has told us a wee bit more of the history that we've been talking about when it comes to St Mary's and I was speaking to uh, the canon just yesterday and he said a brilliant thing and I think this is a, with a lot of priests they're, they're very poetic when they're talking to you you know what I mean so mm -hmm. they're reading a lot obviously um, day to day uh, but when they verbalise their thoughts, they do it in such a way that you think to yourself, Tony, if you put that down on paper, it would look fantastic. And he was talking about how uh, Celtic Football Club and St Mary's are, you know, the tapestry is interwoven. Um, but there is a feeling that in recent times, it's frayed. It's been frayed a wee bit. So you imagine the tapestry fraying and coming loose and we need to try and tighten it up again and we need to try and get the links back directly to Celtic Football Club. Now, that isn't there at the moment, and that surprised me. Um, I don't think that's the same with the Celtic support because the the uh, amount of passion that Celtic fans have for the history and for St Mary's, the birthplace of the club, um, is there for all we see, and it's been there all, all weekend so far. But I think that hopefully we can kickstart something off, Tony, that we can continue with. Uh, on Axon, other Celtic fans can get involved in and hopefully long term the future of St Mary's uh, will be a lot brighter than it is at the moment because they are struggling financially Yeah, I wrote something on the group chat this morning and I'm going to read it out because I think it's kind of this is why we're doing this today that we're ha are having a charity weekender and I wrote to all the guys if you know your history today is all about preserving the very foundation of our football club Celtic Park will always be a spiritual football home and the place where all our football hearts lie. Today we fight to make sure Celtic's birthplace will never become a paradise lost. Today we represent everything that is great about Celtic Football Club. Today we will let our very own primal scream be heard on the pod. Today we raise money for those less fortunate. Today we hope to give others dreams and songs to sing moving forward. Today we really are representing a community and a cause. Today shows why this club is in our DNA. Today shows why we have a Celtic state of mind. Today truly is what it means to be Celtic. And today these two parishes will know that they will never walk alone. Being a Celtic supporter is not always easy, but it is always worthwhile. Days like today make it all worthwhile. And that's my thoughts. And I echo what you've said to all the pod pods that have come together today for such a special cause and for a cause that just should tug at the heartstrings of every Celtic supporter and for every donation so far and uh, the £15,000, it's, it's a wonderful total. And I think this does just strike at the very core of what Celtic is all about and what it means as a club, uh, the, the very birthplace of the club. And that just that's what grips you about today. And... Yeah, I think people, I think the Celtic supporters have rallied to the cause, will continue to rally to the cause, and the final total will just be staggering. And uh, I applaud everybody that's got involved, all the fellow podcasters, because we're all supposed to not get along. Isn't that right, guys? Thanks for everybody's effort. It's been magnificent. And this is one of the most humbling things that you can do to help and raise money for charity. And I think the Celtic supporters are second to none at that. Brilliant. Tony, fantastic words. You sent that to the group this morning that kind of blew everybody away. Um, kind of stopped me in my tracks when I was reading the words because it basically epitomised everything that I was thinking. Uh, but you have a knack of putting it into words, which is probably why I don't write anymore. So thank you very much for that. Um, now, you're right. 
there is no pod wars, you know, that, that's a myth. There is no pod <laughs> wars. That, that's for different types of podcasts. Um, I've said, and I've said, and I've always said that the amount of talent that's available to Celtic fans out there in terms of alternative media is incredible, but I don't think that's a new phenomenon. Mm. I mean, I'm always talking about the old fanzine days, Deck, and I know you still write for a fanzine or two, uh, because yeah. I think you, you've you've certainly written for uh, more than 90 minutes and the alternative view. Um, and I just think that when you think about Celtic and culture and the arts and literature and music um, and film and all of these things, then they go hand in hand. I mean, you go back to the 1980s and know that fanzines in terms of Celtic um, were running for years before the 1980s, but they really came to the fore when there was a fan movement deck. And the, the one that captured my imagination um, was not the view. And I remember when I used to go to the games, all I was interested in was getting a program. But you would see these other people selling stuff. And I remember there was there was a few Irish publications that my dad used to buy just to keep himself abreast of the political situation. And I never really uh, read into that at the time. I, I later did, retrospectively. Um, but then I remember a guy at my school. Now, bearing in mind, my primary school was in Midlothian uh, for, a, for a much part of it. And there was a guy in my school because most of them were Hibs and Hearts fans. There was no Rangers fans, mainly Hibs. Um, but there was a few Celtic fans. Myself, a guy called Colin Dewey, and another guy called Kevin Causer. Kevin, Barry, Michael, Causer. And I remember Kevin, Barry, uh, brought Not The View into the school this day. And I'm like, what the F is that? Because obviously it was a DIY effort, photocopied pages, but he gave me it. And I think it was issue 13. It was the issue, right? And it had a picture of Jack Inoski, Paul Elliott, Mike Galloway, and Le Petit Merd on the front cover. <laughs> and there was a speech bubble coming out every single one of their mouths. And it was... I always wanted to play for Celtic. I always wanted to play, for, and when it got down to me more, dot dot dot. So that that was me hooked on the fanzine culture back then, and I think that was 1987. So back then, Celtic fans were already at the forefront of what was then called fan media, rebel media. It used to be called Tony. Uh, it's now referred to as alternative media. And back then, uh, the not the not view. I, I remember like. A lot of the, the monthly football magazines would list the top selling fanzines in Britain, and not the view was always bothering the top spot. And I think maybe on one of the interviews that we Stevie Murray done, where he spoke to Joe Miller, um, and Joe Miller, the average Joe Miller, not super Joe Miller, and uh, there was a discussion around the peak sales hitting something like thirty thousand back in the day. I mean, that is astonishing when you think about that. 30,000 copies for a monthly fanzine. So I think Celtic uh, fans have been at the forefront of alternative media since back then, Dick. Um, and it's incredible that even to this day, not the view still exists, the alternative view still exists. Uh, more than 90 minutes is still out there. There might be a few others that I've, I've failed to mention. Uh, but I think we've always said that in, in us, haven't we, as a fan base? Yeah, and, you know, through troubled times, I think they're always really important, especially, you know, the era that you're referring to there, Paul, especially that mid-90s period when there was, you know, not the view, um, once the time, etc., out because these were important to hold the board to account. We didn't have social media, we didn't have podcasts at the time, and it was important for Celtic fans to, you know, not pick up the, the mainstream media. At times, it was always going to probably paint Celtic in a bad light. Um, it was better to get the real fans' perspective and, as you touched on it, I still write in, you know, the Alternative View magazine. That is what we try and be as a, an alternative view um, to the Celtic view, uh, especially when that's, you know, if you look at the, the downfall of the Celtic view recently, it's I think it's now coming out every three or four months now. So it shows that the market is changing. But, you know, certainly from our perspective at the Alternative View, there's definitely still a want for um, a fanzine out there. People still regularly buy the, the fanzine at the match. And we did miss out on those sales through the pandemic, but we kept going. I think we were the only printed uh, Celtic fanzine to be out there throughout the pandemic. And then um, we did have a you know few play about words with uh, stuff like you're, you're talking about. I mean, I think our last issue, we've got Big Ange in the front, we've got Struff Mate and Where's Gavin's Laptop? Has anybody found Ryan Christie's balls, etc.? So um, Matt still 
imaginative as ever uh, with the front covers. And we're still going, so I think our next issue will be out just before uh, Christmas. I think we're planning on it being out next week, and as per usual, it's packed with a lot of um, good writers, good stories, and an alternative view in Celtic Football Club at this point in time. What I love about it, what I love about the fanzine uh, kind of culture, and you do get, I mean, listen, the last 18 months, it's been, I'm not going to say doom and gloom, it's been all very serious uh, in the world of Celtic, uh, but you do get the humour. You, you do get that, you know, the humorous side of the Celtic fan base. And Tony, I always think back about self-deprecating humour. Uh, we were having a wee chat about it today and how, you know, I think it shows a lot about somebody when they can actually, you know, um, take the mickey out themselves. And it kind of shows that, you know, there isn't the ego there or uh, the elitist attitude that, you know what, I'm not perfect, but that's fine. We are not perfect as a football club and that's fine as well, but we are going to tell you what's wrong with the club. And I think that has always existed within the Celtic fan base. Oh, without a doubt, self-deprecation is the way forward. <clears throat> always has been a... I like to take the mic out myself a lot because there's a lot to take the mic out of, you know. So I, uh, I, uh, I embrace self-deprecation in the club, and especially a lot of talented writers have always been on point with stuff like that. The not the view was a staple during the the troubled times of the nineties. It really was. Remember the you are the ref. Yeah, you're the ref. I, I brought that up the other week, yeah, and it was and it was brilliant. You had a football scenario. And they had an A, B, C, or D, and D was always book Paul Elliott, which, I mean, that was just that was just genius, right? Because I think Paul Elliott picked up a record 16 bookings in the spin, I believe. Uh, Paul Elliott will tell you yourself. Uh, but yeah, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that that's genius, you know. It's and uh, and they were always they were always sharp to the point where the Green Brigade as well. You know, there might be uh, some guys there and. Some banners and stuff are really clever. Their, their humour has always been on point. It's never missed the target if it's humorous, and and that's kind of and it's kind of gone from the, the manifestation of the the mags, the alternative view. Declan's still there, giving us his humour in the alternative view. Or do you, Declan? Do you give us your humour in the alternative view? I hope that comes out as well when you're writing. Uh, you know, and it's uh, there's a lot, a lot of clever people. That do that write for these kind of publications, uh, and you know they let's love everything else. Football's meant to be fun. Even when you lose, you can still poke fun at your football team, but you can also have that serious side and say, "Well, here is an alternative view of what's happening." And uh, yeah, long may that continue because it's 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 one of the things that Celtic supporters do well. They shine a light on things like today with the charity, mm-hmm. but they also shine a light in the deficiencies at the club and they also shine a light on the good things that the club do too but they all they always 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 do it in a humorous way see the thing as well though when you think about the not the view is what they did for me as a a young kid growing up was they educated me tony yeah and they educated me politically but they also educated me in relation to what was happening at my football club because at that age all you're interested in is the football you want to read about Paul McStay. You know, I used to read Shoot, Match, Roy the Rovers, The Celtic View, and Not the View. And like that, you are the ref thing. That was a take, that was a parody mm. of something that was in the shoot yeah. where there was a scenario. And what do you do as the referee? And it gave you the options and it was like a quiz. And at the end, it would show you, but Not the View had like that, had a spin on it. And <laughs> it was D. Book Paul Elliott. No matter what happened, let's book Paul Elliott. <laughs> and, and that's funny, isn't it? Nothing much has changed, is it? Really? Yeah. Book a Celtic player. Um, so I think when we're talking about fanzines, it's important to note how pivotal they were in the changes that eventually happened at Celtic. How important that street movement was with regards to save ourselves, Celts for change, Fergus McCann, the takeover. I mean, it's all interlinked uh, because they were educating the Celtic fans in what was happening at the club. They were talking, I mean... You look at issue one, you're not the view, uh, because Jim Orr very kindly gave me all the back issues a few years back, uh, because over the over the years with house moves and et cetera, all my old ones had gone. And I remember reading it, issue one, and they were talking about Celtic becoming a PLC. And I'm, I'm reading this as a young guy's thinking, what is that? Why would we want to do that? Then they start explaining to you about the dynasty 
and how there's an ineptitude in terms of business acumen within the club. And then was what that, then happens was is... Was that the Mingan dynasty you're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And then, and then what happens is the Taylor Report happens a few years later and everything catches up with Celtic and the modernisation of football overtook Celtic and we didn't have the vision within the club to actually withstand that. Meanwhile, our greatest rivals at that time did. They had the stadium, they bought the players and they went on a, a run in nine league titles in a row as a result of that. So in terms of media, and this wasn't part of the discussion points, by the way, but we're just going to run with it today. In terms of alternative media, I think Celtic, I've always been at the forefront and I think this weekend shows that we are still very healthy as a fan base when it comes to producing content. Now, one of the finals exam finest examples recently, and you were involved in this deck, unsurprisingly, was, uh, all right, there's a president of Albania. <laughs> Let's do an interview with him. You know, now, that wasn't a mainstream channel. That wasn't a big media company. That was a couple of fanzines, Declan, that organised that. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, Marcel's in more than 90 minutes. Big Millish was there too. And um, we got a good uh, interview out of El Presidente. He was talking to us about uh, Celtic versus Partizan Tirana in 1979. He remembers that it was a big event in Albania at the time. Um, because of, you know, Albania being under communism at the time, he said there wasn't a lot of entertainment on the TV. And um, he remembers it's been a big event. They didn't usually show any sports on television. And then he watched it. And then years later down the line, his um, his friend Rudy Vata ends up at Celtic Park. He, he kept in touch with uh, with Rudy through that, and then um, you know Rudy obviously everybody knows about Rudy and um, especially that famous goal against Rangers. And you know ever since then he's been a Celtic fan. And he was on a a, um, a presidential visit to uh, Bosnia, and that's when he bumped into Celtic supporters in the uh, twenty. 18, 2019, that be? 2018? 2019, sorry. And, um, you know, so the kind of white hoops went over. He said, I am going to to greet them on behalf of the people of Albania for Rudy Vata. I will, I will greet the, the Celtic supporters. And and that was it. And then we were actually leaving the hotel. He was sitting having a chat with uh, Albina Yeti. Obviously, Albi, I think, was born of uh, born either in Albania, but plays for Switzerland due to parents. But, yeah, you know, another one of the Celtic fan media just going out there, whereas I think Celtic just didn't want to really publicise it because obviously there's a political background to it, but um, yeah, something a bit surreal. Didn't think I'd meet a head of state before I was 25, but hey-ho, there we were. And then we're interviewing a Hollywood superstar in Glasgow, Tony, and who's he asking for? He's not asking for Celtic legends, he's asking for <laughs> death in the convo, or perhaps you are one, I don't know. I think speaking, probably. Of, speaking of Celtic legends in Albania, Danny McGrain's got the great beard story, hasn't he? Mm. About, the beard, uh, the, the beard yeah, of Tirana. Yeah, get into <laughs> yeah, Albania, and it's it's just terrific. It's just terrifically surreal that they weren't going to let him in to the country. I know. Because he had a beard. I mean, it's just the, the press it, ran the story, didn't they? That he, did, he was going to have to have a shave. Yeah. Before we went to Albania. And Danny delightfully tells you it's it's utterly astonishing. You know, in 1979. You know, as Declan said, and uh, yeah, and it's 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 comedically surreal. You know, a football story. It's brilliant. It's it's fantastic. You, you're not getting into a country. Why? Because you have facial hair. <laughs> it's just it's astonishing that, isn't it? Really, when you think about it. Uh, no, it is. And uh, he also had the nickname Barabbas, didn't he? <laughs> he did, indeed. Uh, but I did ask. I remember <laughs> many, many moons ago, I do remember speaking to Rudy Vata. Rudy, of course, whose son is tearing it up um, at mm. a, an underage level for Celtic at the moment. And he's played for the B team as well. Um, now capped under 19, I think, for the Republic of Ireland deck through his, his mother's mother. I believe, yep. from Dublin. Um, so it's tremendous to see him. I'm a bit concerned, actually, about Rocco because he's the guy that's uh, tearing it up at the moment and we've lost a lot of talent before they've actually played for the first team, Declan. What can we do as a football club to prevent that from happening with Rocco Vata? I think it's about creating that, that pathway that I think, you know, Angie's, you know, meeting for some guys at this point in time, Paul. Um, you know, the other night, obviously, another sales at Youth Academy products coming out of the park. And Adam Montgomery, um, I was listening to the, the boys for Celtic, the funder before I was coming on, talking about Michael Johnson. He's still very young. I know a lot of Celtic fans probably, you know, at this point in time, just don't think he's going to cut the grade. But it's about, you know, getting the opportunities. And uh, 
been handed the opportunity, something which you know wasn't the case last season. I think a lot of us forgot that Tony Ralston was only twenty two last season, and from you know what I watched last season, um, I think Tony Ralston, and not just watching this season, you know, he came in in that game against Livingston, when we were, um, you know, very completely decimated by numbers, and you know, played a, a game. Uh, played far better in the game than I ever saw in John Joe Kenny in a Celtic jersey. So it's about creating a pathway for Celtic players and not just, you know, relying on the markets and, and giving youth a chance at Celtic Park. Um, if John Lennon can sing Give Peace a Chance, Big Ange needs to give youth a chance at Celtic Park. Listen, I wouldn't pass, I wouldn't put anything past Ange Postacoglu. I think what he's done, um, there's a podcast in itself on the players that he's rejuvenated. I mean, we mentioned three of them regularly on the show. Ralston, the aforementioned Ralston, uh, Beaton, I think, has been rejuvenated as a midfield player. Uh, and also Big Tommy Rogic, who again the other night showed that when we have him on the park, there's a different dimension to our, our uh, attack and play. He brings a creativity. He can unlock the defence. I mean, Declan, you spoke really well fairly recently. You, you were making all the links between Ange um, and Pushkas and Hungarian football. And, you know, you you were looking at that. We went right back to the 1954 World Cup um, with regards to, you know, Jockstein being absolutely mesmerised by the Hungarian side back then. What was ever going to uh, unlock the door bolt or Catanacho, as it was called? And it was it was the fast, entertaining, rip-roaring football, Tony. Um, so, so I think that when, when we're looking at Ange and what he can do, um, at Celtic uh, and the players that he is using and utilising at Celtic, it's that type of player that can unlock the door bolt. You know, the team that unlocked the Catanaccio was the Lisbon Lions. And for me, absolutely love it. Um, yes, from time to time, like the other night, it's a hearts and mouth moment, two minutes from the end, if hearts almost score. But they didn't, as Tony reminded us, and that's that's 100% right. Same with Aberdeen. Uh, Juranovic clears one off the line. The argument is, well, as a defender, should he not be doing that? Absolutely, we won the game. We won the game and we came away with maximum points. And it is, it's exciting again uh, to watch Celtic. Uh, absolutely. And he's bringing in players who give you that entertainment and excitement. And again, we were talking about humour. David Kelly, uh, having looked at our tagline, uh, says Valderrama, Elton and Donati look different from how I remember them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure which one I am. Out the three, um, I was always a fan. I've got to say, I was always a fan of Donati. I thought he was a cultured player. He was one of these guys that um, seemed to fall out of favour with Gordon Strachan, and there was like long periods of time, like he did with a lot of players. Strachan seemed to fall out of a player, make his mind up about him. Derek Riordan, Tommy Gravison, Massimo Donati, and others, and they they basically just wouldn't get a game. But I remember when Tony Mowbray came in. And for a very short period of time, the Natty looked like a player again. He was always a player. I mean, at that time, I don't know if the record's been broken now. He had the record of Italian under-21 international caps. That shows you, I mean, I think AC Milan bought him for something like 12 million quid at one point. Um, and it looked as though Mowbray was getting a tune out of him, which was tremendous because we've just spoken about rejuvenating players. But what happened at that point? You'll remember he scores against Arsenal. Um we had Arsenal in, the, in Europe that season. He scored against Arsenal away. It was in the away leg, I think. Um, and shortly afterwards, we sell him. Mm -hmm. And there was another move similar to that. A player that Mowbray had brought in. Remember Danny Fox? Yeah. So we bring Danny Fox. He ended up getting a cap or two for Scotland, I think. Brought him in, and then we sold him pretty quickly. You know, before the season was... So we brought him in and sold him in the same season for a profit. And... What actually happened there was that annoyed Mowbray because he wanted to keep Danny Fox. But the power brokers at Celtic were happy to make, what was it, 500 grand profit on a player? So they saw that as good business sense. But the problem is you've lost your left back and you're having to get Edson Braffite in on one. Mm -hmm. you know? Similarly with Donati, he was sold without... Mowbray's consent. <coughs> now, I don't know, Tony, if you ever spoke to Tony Mowbray about this, but Donati was sold from under the nose of Tony Mowbray. He wanted to keep him. The club sold him. And I think at that stage, Mowbray himself realised the game's up here. You know, I, how on earth can I progress when I'm getting a tune out of a player 
But because there's a half decent offer on the table, the club are going to sell him. It's not like we were struggling for cash at the time. Um, but the reason the Natty's on there is because Tony, you're going to give us your own special memories of Massimo Donati. Yeah, the headline was basically I wanted to do something a wee bit different uh, today and just sort of let people into some anecdotal stories from my, my time. Well, I'm still a journalist, obviously, but the Massimo Donati one's just uh, incredible. I, I was asked, I we'd heard, I was working at the record at the time and we'd heard that Massimo Donati was going to sign for Celtic. So I got in touch with his agent, a guy called Andrea D'Amico, on the Monday. And he said, no, don't know where you're hearing that from. And then the Tuesday, that had kind of changed. And he said, maybe, a definite maybe. But by the Friday, the trail had gone cold. And then Jim Trainer came to me on the Friday night and said, just before I left on the Friday night, and said, anything happening with Donati? And I'm like, no. And he was like, hmm, you might want to check that out. I just thought, okay, left on the Friday night, half five, got up the road at six, went to my one of my local boozers in East Bride, the Bonnie Prince Charlie Bar, and it's about half eight, and I'm about six or seven Southern Comfort and Lemonade's in. So it was beginning to annoy me, and I thought, I'm going to phone Andrea D'Amico to see if anything this is happening. This, you know, it was nipping away at the back of my head. So I punched the number in, and they get the foreign ringtone. And I've said, hello, Andrea. And to my utter astonishment, you talk about manna from heaven, Andrea D'Amico says, yes, Peter, I have faxed the details. Three million pounds is the transfer fee. Massimo Donati transferred to Celtic from AC Milan for three million. Did you receive the fax? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And I've, and I've just clicked into gear and I've went, eh, Andrea, it's Tony Haggerty. And then all of a sudden I got, I know speaker, the English. And the phone <laughs> went dead. So I phoned Jim Trainer, and I've said, Massimo Donati signing for Celtic, three million quid, four-year deal, I believe. He's like, how do you know this? And I have told him the set of circumstances. He's killing himself laughing. And he says to me, where are you? I says, I'm in the Bonnie Prince Charlie Bar in East Bride. And he says, no more drink, because you're going to have to file this. <laughs> he says, are you near your house? And I'm like, nowhere near my house. <laughs> and he says, can you, I said, I'll go on the phone. He says, I'll phone you back. And so I'm standing underneath a lamppost outside the Bonnie Prince Charlie Bar in East Bride. And he phones me back and he says, I don't know how you did it, but you're spot on. He says, but your punishment for that, and because I got the story stood up, is my name first. So it's an exclusive by Jim Trainer and Anthony Haggerty, and that's how it appeared in the record the next day. I'm standing under a lamppost. Massimo Donati last night clinched a sensational three million pound move to Celtic from AC Milan. You know, the the under twenty one internationalist or with most caps, all that that was one spot for twelve million, uh filed it and uh trainer phoned me back and said, Did you file it? I said, Yeah. He says where are you now? I says, I'm getting drunk. <laughs> She's like, okay, you've earned it. And uh, sure enough, it appeared the next day in the back page uh, by Jim Trainer and Anthony Haggerty that Massimo Donati had signed for Celtic for three million quid. And uh, an astonishing set of journalistic circumstances where he clearly thought that the mobile ringtone from Britain was Peter Lowell getting in touch. I just, I, I, you could, you could not write that, could you? But Eventually, I did have to. But you it. make your own luck, Tony. You yeah. made the phone call. I, I, it was the it was the warning: no more drink that, that had me killing myself laughing. You know, it, it's just uh, I thought that was that was uh, typical of Jim Trainer, but he, he had a point to be fair. So, but yeah, and that was my Massimo Donati story. <laughs> was like... what, what's your memories, Deco Donati? I mean, I always think of uh, players who had the undoubted talent, but their time at Celtic was quite fleeting. Uh, we probably didn't see the best of them. And that, that's how I kind of viewed and that he ended up playing for Hamilton Academicals, didn't he? Hmm. Yeah, he, he did. Um, obviously, I remember that goal against the uh, Shakhtar Donetsk, and, which I think everybody remembers him for. But I do remember um, the 07 08 uh, away kit that came out for the, the 40th anniversary of the Lisbon Lions. It was a kind of really dark green 
mm. away kit. I don't know if you remember it. I had Donati eating in the back of that as a seven seven year old. Yeah, so um, I was obviously. So did he actually going. take the eighteen then? Did he inherit the eighteen from Neil Lennon? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, mm. um, so. Lenny had departed. Where was it? Lenny went to Wickham or somewhere? Went down south somewhere? You know, go to Forest first. Not in Forest. Not in Forest. Not in Forest, then, Forest uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, so I remember Lenny's last game at Celtic Park, and I think, you know, the next season, Donati's came in and taken the, the 18 right away. But yeah, I had that in the back of the jersey. So I must have been quite fond of him. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, as you mentioned there, Paul, you know, he scored down at the, the Emirates. Or, I know you still call it Highbury. Um, but the. The home game at Celtic Park that night, I think my old man still gutted because instead of going to see you two at Hamden, they opted for Celtic versus Arsenal at Celtic Park and we get gubbed. I think that was the 360 tour at Hamden when the stage rotated right around mm-hmm. the whole uh, stadium. And then, so he ditched Bono for a night out with Tony Mowbray, which I think he still uh, regrets to this day. But hey ho, that's what being a Celtic fan is all about, isn't it? It is now the thing is though it's interesting how like history when you get to my age deck you know you remember when you two were still cool you remember when it was still alright to like them. Cool, cool. Uh, well cool. you know this is the thing I mean I, I've said it a few times on here I the first time I went to a gig was to see you two at Celtic Park so it was almost perfect there were a band that were omnipresent. In my house, you know, Joshua Tree, Rattle and Hum, that was the kind of albums my old man listened to. And then I got into them. Acton Baby was the album that blew me away. By the time they played Celtic Park in 1993, it was the Zoo TV tour, so they had released or were about to release Zuropa. And we went and we watched them. And it was incredible because it was an, an absolute spectacle. It wasn't just there's a band on the stage running through a set. The entertainment value was incredible. Uh, the big screens, the live satellite um, to Sarajevo, you know, Bono coming on dressed up as McFisto, who was this kind of devil-like character. Alter ego. Aye, an alter ego, and, you know, he's phoning, like, world leaders and all that uh, to try and tell them how to run the country and uh, stop oppressing other nations and stuff like that. So back then, you know, he ticked all the boxes for a, a left-wing Celtic supporter, as I was, and the music was brilliant. I mean, Actoon Baby... Regardless of what you think of you two now, if you listen to that album in isolation, Tony, I don't know what your relationship has been with you two, but if you listen to that album, Actun Baby, it's unbelievable to this day. I was listening to it on my way through the studio this morning. There's a lyric in one of the songs. In my dreams, I was drowning my sorrows, but my sorrows, they learned to swim. Yep. You know, yeah, stuff like that. Music with uh, songs with words. You know, and that grips you, you know, when you're old enough to appreciate the uh, breathtaking writing like that. And they played Saturday and Sunday night uh, at Celtic Park. Uh, I was at both because they featured prominently in my life. Uh, one of my first gigs was uh, you 2 at the SEC just after they'd released Josh- the Joshua Tree. And it was an astonishing uh, concert as well. Seen them many times. And, yeah, that's... Uh, it's a big band in my life, as it's a big band in your life and Declan's. I know Declan's a big fan. Uh, I continue to be a fan. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the, there are so many U2 highlights you could pick out. But, yeah, just a, a phenomenal band. Uh, and, yeah, you can argue the toss about, you know, the political side to them. But that that's what gave them their edge, wasn't it? You know, so... Uh, Pardon yeah. pun. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> in fact, I didn't... Didn't mean that, yeah. But you know, I think I think lots of people of our generation and obviously Declan's have had a U2 phase in their life. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I think back really, really fondly to that. And I remember that the support bands the night I went, because I I'm just gonna name drop here. If that's all right. I've already name dropped Declan. <laughs> it's not as big as that, but I'm gonna name drop. Uh, I was chatting to James Allen of Las Vegas recently when he came to play the festival in Dalkeith that we covered. And we were talking about the fact, Tony, that they played the two nights. I think I went on the Sunday. I would need to dig the ticket out. I'm, I'm sure it was a Sunday, but what James was saying is that the, the support bands were different on mm. the two nights. But I remember who supported them. It was the Stereo AMCs and the Utah Saints yep. the night I went. I think on the Saturday night, was it not PJ Harvey that was supporting you two? Yeah. On a Saturday night, and then it opens up that whole thing about well, 
with Celtic Park there, who else has played Celtic Park? And we know that the Who played. Was that 1975? Was it 75? 75, 76, it's the Who put the boot into her. Yeah, yeah. 76, I think. There's a great poster. There's a yep. brilliant poster of uh, the Who and yeah. I think Celtic, yeah. but there's certainly a football in it. Yeah, they um, play, I think, Coventry, and I think they play Craven Cottage or somewhere in London, Paul. I think they were doing football stadiums around football the UK. Stadiums. But um, Sensation Alex Harvey Band, I think, were one of the the um, the bands on underneath them, because I've got the, the bootleg there somewhere. Uh, of Sensation Alex, Yeah, the Sensation Alex Harvey Band at Celtic Park. I think it's the Did only album I've got live at Celtic Park. Phenomenal, and and of course, people in the comment section, please throw in any anybody that we miss here. But Prince, yeah, yeah, played at Celtic Park, and was it not the case, Tony, that um, Shakespeare's sister supported Prince? Yes, and one of the members of Shakespeare's sister was a Celtic fan, due virtue of the the father being a big Celtic man. I think it was was it the was it Siobhan Fahey that was in. Uh, Banana Rama. Banana Rama. Yes. I'm sure it was her that was the Celtic fan. There was some Celtic connection because I think her dad was a big Celtic man. I'm, I'm sure I read that because I think the, the tabloid papers went big on that when mm-hmm. they found that out. But yeah, I'm sure it was. What gets me though, right? We've seen a lot of people. Uh, the Queen that we saw at Celtic Park wasn't the one with Freddie Mercury, of course, but we see a lot of people at Celtic Park. And I wonder, there must be photographs behind the scenes. You know what I mean? Hmm. They must have had a wee look about the stadium. They must have been behind the scenes at Celtic. And the reason I, I say that is because I've never seen any of the U2. I've, I've seen video. There's actually, the gig I was at is on YouTube. Um, there's a bootleg kicking about as well. I've got photos, but they're not in my my possession. They're with the, the chap, a good pal of mine at the time. They're in his possession, Charlie Hutton from High Valleyfield. He's got all the photos. I'd love to see them someday. But there must be images of like Bono and the Edge and Larry and, and Adam in Celtic Park, Tony. You know, maybe getting shown around the, yeah. the boardroom or, or the, the trophy room. And then I start thinking, well, where did Prince go at Celtic Park? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you get artists and then you get superstars. And Prince is a superstar in my eyes. And he must have been hanging about Celtic Park. I'd love to see I, pictures of that. I'm glad Prince didn't play the old Celtic Park when he was like, where's it? The facilities and you're standing against a brick wall. You know what I mean? And you imagine telling Prince, you know, this is this well, is welcome to the jungle. Welcome yes. to the jungle. We, we've got fun and games. You know, so uh, yeah, but, yeah. I mean, the you would have to think that there would be some images of of these things kicking about, but who would have them? You know, you would love to unearth uh, those to see to see what they actually thought because it's a it's a cracking stadium arena, isn't it, to play, I would have thought. It is. The reason I ask, actually, is because um, someone sent me a message recently and it got me thinking about the time that the Wolf Tones visited Celtic Park. Mm. And there's obviously a story in this because they eventually recorded a video, yeah, uh, a, a promo video in the stadium wearing the centenary top. And I remember watching that thinking that could never have been agreed. It was a Celtic Symphony video. It was the Celtic Symphony. They could never have agreed to that. Celtic could never have agreed to that. But then what happened was images started filtering out of the Wolf Tones getting a wee tour of the stadium. So there's pictures of like Tom Grant, the the director at the time, with the Wolf Tones. They're they're at the dressing room door and a youth player's coming out to speak to them. It was a guy called Declan Roach, the Irish lad that we had at the time. So he obviously was aware of the band. And obviously controversial uh, as it was, it shows that the band had a wee walk around the park. And I just think, you know, it would be really smart if there were images of you 2 or or Prince or indeed Shakespeare's sister, the Who, actually in the dressing rooms and all this kind of stuff. There's brilliant images of Frankie Miller <coughs> in the Celtic dressing room with, with Jinky and Tommy Burns deck. Uh, and every so often they pop up as well. Uh Obviously, Frankie being a, a huge Celtic fan and a good pal of Jinky. But that's the reason why Massimo Donati is on the headline. And uh, what I'm going to say to everybody in the, the comments section, thank you very much for getting involved. Um, we opened the, the fundraising uh, GoFundMe page just a matter of days ago. I'm on it just now. It's telling me that it was created three days ago, right? And we currently have... 15,940, 10 grand of that um, isn't counted on the GoFundMe page because it's been given as a donation um, 
directly. So 15,940. So we're £60 short. He hit 16K before we finish the show at six o'clock. And I think that is doable. And for everybody that's given any amount, uh, and by the way, for anyone who's also given us auction items, because we're going to run an auction, it's just that it's not live yet. But after the charity weekend, there's going to be one week where I think we've got about 30 auction items, 90% of which were given to us and gifted to us over the last week or so. Kevin Tate at the penalty spot gave us eight I was going to say half a dozen, but he came back today with another couple items. In fact, he's given us nine items to auction off. Unbelievable. Uh, and that just shows you the power of the, the Celtic fan base because I think that, um, you know, we can argue and debate and disagree, Declan, but when the chips are down, we can pull together as well. Yeah, we always can pull together. And, you know, Kevin's one of the good guys, as there is many in the Celtic support that, always helps out um, running a CSC as well. Sometimes when you do need help, a lot of the guys will, will rally around you and give you that help which you need and that's just, you know, what, what, it's, what it's all about being part of, you know, the Celtic family. I know it's a, a line that the club like to use but the Celtic family really are the support and, and times like this and they lead up to Christmas, you know, I think that the ethos of Celtic Football Club is still alive and well within the fan base itself. Um, It's just a pity that, you know, those that, sitting suits in the boardroom maybe don't share that same uh, responsibility as the fans do but when you need the fans to step up they always do it you know earlier on just before we came in um, when the two Ryans and Kieran were on we were actually talking about this out the front and I said I don't think there's a refusal in the Celtic board I just don't even think it crosses their mind Declan I think they're so far removed they're not refusing it they just don't even consider the mm. fact that that would be the right thing to do. It would be the right thing to do for the club to have something in place that ensures that, you know, St Mary's are not in this position. I mean, by the end of this weekend, their immediate financial concerns will be resolved. We already know that looking at the, the figure. If we never raised another pound after this show, we've already raised enough to alleviate their financial concerns. They are doing incredible community work. Um, they are they are looking after uh, vulnerable people within the community, and obviously that comes at a cost as well. And I just think that basically this would have spiraled out of control, and this is just the immediate concerns. You then look at well, what happens in three to six months if, for example, the financial situation doesn't improve? Well, potentially they'll be back in the same situation again. So in time, I hope that. We as Celtic fans and obviously as a platform, the comment section is always there for suggestions and on social media. That we, we are able to um, structure something where this doesn't happen again. And, you know, if we can do that and we can all chip in our time and money and effort, I'm sure the Celtic fan base can do what should already be getting done. What I was going to say to anybody who's in the comment section is... Please, if you've got anything at all that you want to pitch to us or any questions, any burning questions you wish to ask anybody on here, be that Valderrama, or Elton John or Massimo Donati, then ask the question. Um, and it would be absolutely tremendous if you could ask us. Within reason, anything goes. And we will answer as many questions as you possibly can get through in the next 30 or 40 minutes. Um I was thinking back there to the 80s when the Wolf Tones sneaked in or were invited into Celtic Park. And I was thinking about all the the players who I would have loved to have seen at Celtic Park around about that time. I've got my own favourites. I've spoken about them time and time again on the podcast. Those players that you kind of thought they're, they have a Celtic state of mind, I'd love to see them in the hoops. Now, by the way, it was different times back then, Declan, before I say the first one. I always wanted Pat Nevin to sign for Celtic. I always thought Nevin, you know, both at Chelsea and at Everton, was a Celtic player. You know, he had that Celtic state of mind at the time and he was a, an entertaining player and I would have loved to have seen him in the hoops. Um, I used to think Kevin Gallagher at Dundee United because of his links, obviously, his family links um, to the club through Patsy Gallagher should have ended up at Celtic. It didn't happen. Jim McLean probably didn't want to. Jim McLean didn't. Let me think. There was a there was a obviously the Duncan Ferguson deal from Dundee United to Rangers. 
you, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Tony. That was a bit of a watershed moment because he tended to sell the player like golf. He wouldn't sell golf yeah. to Rangers, but he would sell him to Spurs. Yeah, and then a year later, he yeah, come back to. Yeah, was that was that something that McLean did deliberately? He was never a lover of uh, strengthening a rival yeah. by weakening his own team, and he always took top dollar that he could get for any of his players, and he usually could get that from England. Uh, but Duncan Ferguson was the exception to the rule because Rangers shattered the transfer record, didn't he? Was it four million? I think it was at the time for a transfer between two Scottish clubs. Yeah. You know what? I'd need to actually check because it might even have been at the it time. Might have been a record, it might have been a British record, yeah, Tony. I, I think I think that's what it, what it was. You know, so yeah, I think it, he, that's the way he operated. If he wanted a, a player from Dundee United or from Jim McLean, you would have to go elsewhere to get them because they weren't signing for you to make you stronger and Dundee United weaker. You know, and you were talking about all the pop stars and stuff that have played Parkhead and. I wanted to share the other reason why a man's name's appearing on the the, the screen below you. We've just uh, obviously Bertie Old's death. We've been mourning that the past few while. But when Billy McNeil died, both Bertie Old and John Clark were put up at Celtic Park to speak about him, and. Uh, Bertie came in and he did his usual and, you know, and there was laughs. And I had never, ever spoken to John Clark. My father assures me that John Clark was a wonderful footballer. The older generations that watched the Lions will assure me of that as well, that he was a sensational footballer. But he was never a man of many words. So when, he, when the two of them were put up, I thought that this would be chalk and cheese. And Bertie spoke and he was terrific. But I was more interested as a journalist to hear what John Clark would say about his friend. And I thought it might be really difficult for John Clark because Billy McNeil and him were really, really tight. And he gave me what I have to say is one of the best anecdotal stories that I've ever been privileged to witness as a journalist. He sat there and I knew how upset he was, but he kept his composure and he just turned around and he said, guys, Billy McNeil knew everybody and everybody knew Billy McNeil. He said, we went to Vicarage Road to scout a player one evening. He said, and we drove down all the way. He said, and we got into Watford near the ground, but we couldn't find the ground. He said, so we kind of parked up and we were kind of like, right, we're going to have to ask somebody. A big stretch limo passes them, slams on the anchors and reverses. It's like a huge car. And Billy and John Clark are looking like, what's this? The black window goes down. And Billy, <laughs> Billy rolls his window down like that. <coughs> you know, the next voice he hears is, you're Billy McNeil, aren't you? You're Billy McNeil. And John Clark's digging him in the ribs. And John Clark's telling us all this. And he says, it's Elton John. And John Clark's like, do you know Elton John, Billy? And Billy's like, run with this, run with this. And, and Elton's like, are you going to the game? And they're like, yeah. And he's like, we don't know where the stadium is. And he's like, oh, follow me. So he shouts to the driver, right, drive on, and they follow him. Elton John's got his own private car park of private space. They follow him in. They, they walk into the ground, and Elton John gives him the AAA access all areas. He walks in, and he's like, yeah, these are my two special guests. And there's like, Mr. Billy McNeil, Mr. John Clark, and they're like, oh, yeah, there's tickets there. And he grabs the envelopes. He says, they don't need tickets. You know, he's like, that's their ticket. You know, he's like, I'll explain later walks up the stairs, they get the full royalty treatment, and they said that they were there to scout a player, but Elton John had positioned himself in the director's box in the middle of the two of them, and the whole game he just sort of said, I can't believe I'm with Billy McNeil and, and John Clark, two Lisbon Lions, and he rabbited the whole time about the Lisbon Lions, that Celtic team, and John Clark said he was very, very knowledgeable, and he was brilliant, and he just said he could not believe it. He's like, you're Billy McNeil, Elton John, <laughs> in Big Billy, just as the leader of that team and captain legend, just took it all on his stride. And he's like, how are you doing, Elton? <laughs> it's, like, it's just the most surreal story from the most unlikely source. And I've loved John Clark for that ever since because he appreciated the humour in that and he laughed at a time when his heart was aching. 
at the loss of his friend yep. and his close friend, and he knew he had, and he probably didn't want to sit in front of journalists, uh, but had, but had to, but was given that responsibility because he was so tight with them, and he gave us that absolute gem and a nugget. And as I say, I love John Clark, and uh, I wasn't fortunate or privileged enough to see him play. But for that alone, I had tip to him. And yeah, it's just like, you can picture that, can't you? The, the black window going down. You're, you're Billy McNeil. You know, that's John Clark. It's Brilliant. just priceless. Brilliant. Absolutely priceless. I mean, you're brought to mind because we're talking about Celtic superstars and um, some of the greats that we've had uh, donning the green and white hoops, Tony. I've just pulled up a wee story. I remember interviewing Willie Garner. <laughs> who very briefly played for Celtic. Willie Garner uh, was very successful at Aberdeen uh, prior to coming to Celtic. He was part of uh, Alex Ferguson's team uh, in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. But then he signs for his uh, boyhood hero Celtic. And he was a Denny boy. So he came from the same kind of village as uh, Neely Mocking um, and uh, others. And I think that... The story he told me, Owen Moffat comes with Denny as well, interestingly. Um, he told me this story about John Clark that I'll never forget, and it's got a bit of a superstar tinge to it. So he says, and I'll read it because I brought it up on the site here, uh, my son was born while Celtic were in America for the 1981-82 pre-season. We were staying at a hotel called In on the Park. We trained on a small part of the ground in the park across the road, and the young boys carried the kit over set the cones up, and we just chained, uh, trained in the public park. Celtic have a huge support in New York, and it didn't take long for word to spread amongst the locals. Before we knew it, the supporters were turning up to watch us in decent numbers, and it was great to be part of that. After training, it was a case of walking across the road to go for a shower in the hotel. On this particular day, I was with Roy Aiken, John Clark, and David Proven in the lift when Pelly walked in. Unknown to us, his movie, Escape to Victory, was being previewed in the top floor of our New York hotel. We were all standing there starstruck when Pelly said to John Clark, number six, Hamden, 1966. <laughs> and we, John, calmly replied, correct. <laughs> when we got out of the lift, John turned round to us and said, what do you think of that, boys? <laughs> so, I mean, you I think you've met John Clark, Declan. I mean, that that is just basically for me, that epitomizes John Clark, understated, humble, <laughs> but an absolute bona fide legend. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, I keep in touch with John. John is um, our uni's uh, CSE's patron, so I, I keep in touch with John through that and his daughter Marie. And also, um, my first sale to away game was at Love Street in 2008, February the 24th, 2008. Shinsuke Nakamura scored a 87th, 88th uh, minute winner, a free kick for about 30 odd yards, and it was John that got the tickets. Um, my cousin went to school with John's granddaughter, and Clark has sorted out her tickets for that game. So I need to thank John for my um, first Celtic away game and kind of starting at Love Affair with the older away games, which I still go to regularly now. But to add to that story, um, <coughs> Bertie Funeral last week, Evan Williams, I was chatting to Evan. And Evan's got a house over in, in Portugal and goes over there quite regularly, likes golf, Evan and stuff. This was about 15, 20 years ago. He said he was on a course and a gentleman came up to him and he says to Evan, he says, I know you. And Evan says to the gentleman, he says, I know you too. And it turned out to be Eusebio. And um, <laughs> Evan didn't play, I don't think, in that, that 69 quarter final. John Fallon did play in goals for Celtic. Um, but uh, Evan... Went back to a boozer with Eusebio and I think they had a good old uh, night on the top shelf with the Johnny Walker whiskies and malts, etc. And they were battering them. So yeah, there is a there's certainly a um, wide reach to whether you're a Celtic player or a Celtic fan, some of the people that you can bump into and they instantly recognise you. <laughs> oh, definitely. It's all about name dropping the day, right? So we apologise in advance. I'm going to drop another name, Kevin Graham. There you go. The soon-to-be published poet, Kevin Graham. Uh, find him on Twitter at a Northern Prose, and he speaks about Bob Marley. So <coughs> Kevin visited Nine Mile in Jamaica, and Bob's grave had a hoops top on. Surprise, surprise, Kev, did you also have green gazelles on, mate? Was told by a number of guides that this was Bob's team, and there's a picture of him in an 1978 kit. I remember uh, the Dixie Dean story. Yeah. And we were... Uh, with a guy called, because as I say, I'm apologising in advance about the name dropping. We were with Simon Weir, who's an actor, very good actor, big Celtic fan. 
and he spotted Dixie Deans and he wanted to ask him about Bob Marley. So he went over and he was talking to, to Dixie about Bob Marley. And of course, the story goes that when Dixie Deans was playing in Australia, kind of like at the tail end of his career, uh, there was a gig out there. Bob Marley was playing a gig. Dixie went to it, spoke to him after the, the game, and Bob Marley spoke about the Lisbon Lions. He could recite them. Um, and I, I, what then happened was I was watching the, the the Bob Marley documentary, brilliant documentary. And as most documentaries do, there's a massive photo archive and they'll go through all the photos and they'll turn them into moving images and colourise them and it's a big part of the documentary making. And there's a picture of Bob Marley with Rita and on his shoulders his son, Rohan, and Rohan is wearing a green and white hooped shirt. And I remember watching it going, wow, this is brilliant. This is, you know, adding a wee bit more um, kudos to Dixie's story. And I took a picture of it, put it on Twitter. And people were like, ah, man, that's not even green and white. You know how, how Twitter is. You show them the truth and they still find a way of disbelieving it. Uh, that's just a green and white shirt or that's not even green and white. Well, Rohan Marley actually replied to the tweet confirming that me, me and my dad were big Celtic fans. And it just blew me away. Obviously, the tweet's out there somewhere. But Rohan Marley got involved in the chat, and he was like, nah, me and my dad were big Celtic fans. <laughs> Somebody used to send tapes, and Bob Marley and his son used to watch uh, the leather belts. I love all that. I think yeah. that's absolutely phenomenal. Stuff like that's brilliant, isn't it? It's it is. absolutely incredible. And, uh, and Dixie will tell you that it's, it's true. You know, Dixie... Spoke away to Bob Marley about Celtic and he was very knowledgeable. So, you know, you, you cannot dispute that. It, it's factual. You know? It's corroborated. Yeah. Um, but talking about Celts, uh, we went on a wee tangent there, but that's fine because we've got plenty of time. We're on till six o'clock. Um, can I just also say that the the money, the finances, the, the funds are still coming in. And we have now smashed through the 16 grand barrier. That is tremendous. What an effort. Thank you so much for that. So we're now sitting at £16,075. We're still on day one of the fundraiser. We've got another 12 hours tomorrow. We've got an auction with at least 30 items that we're going to be running as Axon progresses next week. So we'll be pushing that on the daily bulletins, uh, match days, etc. all week next week as well. And it looks as though at this moment, and I'm not counting any chickens, it looks as though we might be edging towards a 20 grand mark, Tony, which is astonishing, isn't it? That's absolutely colossal, yeah. And it's, uh, it's all down to the Celtic supporters. As I said at the start, my opening salvo just it sums them up uh, terrifically well. You just, you just always rise to the occasion. But I think this particular charity weekender strikes a chord and strikes at the very heart of their DNA and Celtic being. You know, they, they just feel it. They always do. And uh, fair play, as I say to every podcast that's getting involved, it's been brilliant. It's been an absolute joy to be in here for all these hours and, uh, and just help do your bit. And everybody that's contributed, you, you should have enormous sense of uh, personal well-being for doing that. And, uh, it just reminds you why you support this wonderful entity and football club that is Glasgow Celtic. Well, it's a massive part of it. I mean, I think as we get into this kind of modern age of football, Tony, where it's box office, forget about all the wee clubs. It's almost as if as lo there's a bourgeois. There, there really is a class system in football now where they're only interested in the big clubs that have got the huge investment. I say big clubs, I'm talking rich clubs. Not big in terms of history or or trophies or heritage. I'm just talking about financial, um, on a financial basis. Celtic are a big club. And I just think we're at that stage. What what differentiates Celtic from other clubs? Well, it is things like the charitable ethos. Yeah. And um, that's where it becomes a disappointment. Yeah, you know, I'm going to caveat this by saying Celtic do fantastic work through the Celtic FC Foundation. Don't get me wrong. Absolutely, they do. But what I'm trying to say here is that St Mary's is as much about part of Celtic's history as some of the greatest figures in the club, right? And that's the foundation of the club, St Mary's, and we can't allow it to go to rack and ruin. So we might, I don't know, light the flare, perhaps, Tony, and hopefully it will grow. And that's down to the Celtic fans. All we're doing is putting it on a platform. It's all down to the Celtic fans and all the other contributors who are going get involved um, as well. Now, <coughs> Kenny comes in. I'm... 
to be honest with you, I'll ask anybody for an interview. Um, Kenny's asking, have we approached Dermot Desmond for an interview to ask why he is involved in our club? Um, and I'll tell you, I think that, you know, what happened when Don McKay came in? For me, um, with regards to the engagement with fans, I thought it was going in the right direction. Um, I think we've, uh, he's put some things in place, actually, that the club have continued with, but he introduced them. Um, and I don't think the regime at Celtic prior to uh, prior to Don McKay were all that interested in doing things like fan media events. Now, by the way, that's not the media team at Celtic. That has nothing to do with them. I mean, they're happy to engage and, you know, they're very helpful when you speak to them. It's the club as a whole. They didn't really want to, to bridge that gap. And I think Don McKay done some brilliant work. Dermot Desmond for an interview. I remember we, this time last year, in fact, we said, we requested an interview with Peter Lowell and um, there was a pledge I forget off the top of my head how much it was I think it was was it a grand several thousand pounds someone had pledged two businesses had pledged money and said get Peter Lowell on the charity weekender and we'll give you this money for charity and we actually uh, approached the club and we got no response so Dermot Desmond I would guess would be the same Kenny I would love to interview him I think fairly recently in Tony, you might remember who it was. Managed to get him on the end of a phone. Uh, there was a journalist in Scotland Times recently. Journalist, wasn't there? And, yeah, and he got him on the phone, didn't he? Got him on the phone, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he failed the test. Yeah, he failed the test. Yeah. So then I asked him, was it three questions, three questions about Celtic? Yeah. yeah, three questions. I think he asked about finance and stuff, didn't he? How many trophies has Celtic won since I've been involved yeah, with the club? Was one, involved, was one of them. Was one of them. Yeah. You know, and because he never asked the answer to three questions, he goes, "Why? Why am I wanting to speak to you?" Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would love to. I mean, we would make that approach, but I doubt that they would be um, they would be interested in that. Strange love the doctor. He died go on. Bob Marley was a massive Celtic fan. Absolutely love all that kind of chat. Um, <laughs> and talking of chat, we've only got Massimo Donati's story. Tony, you're going to have to tell us a Carlos Valderrama one now. Right. <laughs> this is, yeah. well, I like it. Scottish Claymores had a franchise obviously in Scotland. But every March when they were in Scotland, they would have a, a what they called a, a training camp. And it was always in Florida. So I think it was it was either 99 or 2000. I'm sure it was one of those years. They have their usual training camp. And I'm looking if there's any football connection. Maybe Carlos Valderrama's playing for Tampa Bay Mutiny. Anna from Heaven. I phoned Tampa Bay Mutiny press office and we agree to go and see Carlos Valderrama uh, on the way. We arrive on a Monday, we agree to go to the, the ground on a, on a Wednesday. And I've met three South American footballers uh, in my life. Well, I've met probably more, but I've spoken to three. <laughs> Diego, Armando, Perley and Carlos Valderrama. So as trebles go, it's no it's, bad. It's not bad, sorry. It's my... Profession has allowed me that honour and privilege, and I never lose sight of that. It's just, it's, it's astonishing. I always say, going back to South Derby, I'm just a wee guy from East Cobride, a wee specky guy from East Cobride, right? So there you go. So we head out to Tampa Bay, being in East Ground on a Wednesday, do the Claymore thing, and then we, we go out and we meet, the, we meet the press officer, and he greets us like long lost friends, and he says, Tony, he says, there's only one slight problem. I says, oh, yeah. He says, Carlos Valterrama does not speak any English. I says, does anyone speak <laughs> Spanish or Portuguese? And he says, oh, we'll get somebody, we'll, we'll get there. So Carlos Valderrama comes out. He's got the hair, the moustache, just the Carlos Valderrama, you know. I showed you the picture off here, right? I'm standing next to Carlos Valderrama. And he greets us like, oh, his friends, brothers, family. And it's really just surreal. You're standing next to like football royalty, as Declan referred earlier, you know. So we sit down, and what happens, I can only describe it for those of an older vintage, Monty Python's Hungarian, dirty Hungarian phrase book, My Hovercraft is Full of Eels, starts to take place because some guy who's meant to be a translator, just, I don't know what he's saying to him, and Carlos Valderrama's just sitting there, smiling, nodding, and just genuinely happy. I think he thinks we're autograph hunters, to be honest, you know what I mean? And it, it's excruciating for about 15 minutes, and 
So out of utter desperation, you know, your spidey sense kicks in. I say, Carlos, me, point to my chest, Celtic Glasgow. And he, then he just looks at me and he says, Celtic Glasgow. So I turn to the boys and I say, would you like to sign for Celtic Glasgow? And he just goes, Celtic Glasgow. And I've turned to the guys and I went, that's as good an answer as any as we're going to get. Carlos Valderrama last night never refused to rule out a move to Celtic. I phoned my editor and I've, he's cleared a thousand word space in the paper for this. And I've said, and his name's Gordon Waddle, and I can still hear his incredulous laughter down the phone. <laughs> no, that kind of laugh. And he says, are you sure? I said, I'll get something out of it. <laughs> it's like, and I, to this day, I think there was myself and a couple other journalists here. I think we all fashioned a thousand words out of four words that Valderrama said in the phrase that he repeated was Celtic Glasgow with thumbs up. And I kill myself laughing. It was a, a classic case of taking a seven iron to uh, something that a, a foreign footballer had said. And I, and I used the words, he played for Tampa Bay Mutiny, and I just sort of said, well, just as well he never read the Scottish newspapers the very next day because there would have been absolute mutiny in Tampa Bay the next day if he'd have been able to read them. But, uh, yeah, it was one of those moments where we, we had promised something kind of delivered, but kind of not, but it's like ho-hum, you know. It's uh, I, I sit there and I, I picture myself in my head looking across at Valderrama, and, and that, that privilege alone was great. And he, he, he sprung to life when we were taking pictures with him and he had the pen out and stuff. And, you know, it's moments like that where you just say to yourself, wow, that this is where your occupation has taken you mm. in your life. And as I say, I, I never take that for granted. That I'm always very humble and uh, speak with humility about it. It's, it's just an absolute privilege, you know, and... I, uh, last year at this time, I released this. It's a book called Going to Give a Kick of Your Ball, Master, and it's full of anecdotes and stories that I've kind of, the ones that I've told here, I'm writing another book, which those ones will feature in, but this is the one I did before. And I said to you before I came on air, if anybody buys it, it's available on Amazon, it's 5 99 and if anybody wants to buy it over the charity weekend, or Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I will donate all the proceeds to the weekender. Uh, as I say, you can get it on Amazon. It's called Going to Giza Kaki Obama. So it's five ninety nine. Fantastic. And it's, uh, yeah. And that's the picture of me in the front with Diego Armando. Ah, just which, Diego. You that's know, fine. And, and 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 there is no blase way they might seem black. I I pinch myself every day when I see that front cover. I just think it's it's just surreally brilliant and you know, it's uh, there's a lot of self-deprecation in there, and there's a lot of mentions of Celtic and fa family and why I, I support the club. And if you like your football, you might like it. And I think a lot of Axom viewers, listeners bought it, and I say thank you for that. Uh, and if anyone else wants to buy it over the weekend, I'll gladly donate the money to to the Super. Uh, weekender. That's a great gesture. Thank you, Tony. Um, I went on a wee tangent again there. Sorry, guys, I never got to ask you the question about who you wanted to sign for Celtic. But uh, somebody <laughs> comes in here, and I'm going to have to put this one up here because, there we go, Michael McDonald. Michael says, always heard that Peter Beardsley trained at Parkhead. Uh, when in Scotland, was this true? Wouldn't uh, Would have been my dream sign. And Michael, you're watching on YouTube. That's a great question because um, we did very, very... Early on in a Celtic state of mind, um, we interviewed. I don't know if you were in that that day, Deck. We were in Stirling at the toll booth where we used to record, and we interviewed Tom Grant. So Tom Grant comes along, and he was very open, very very open about a number of subjects. Mm -hmm. we never asked him about the Wolf Tones, actually. A, a, a number of subjects. Spoke about the Mo Johnson transfer, everything else, and we spoke about the players that we almost signed. So before I throw this to you two guys, I'm going to tell you a couple of the stories based on that Peter Beardsley question there. So, Celtic were indeed interested in buying Peter Beardsley from Liverpool. Now, have a look at the timeline. He went from Liverpool to Everton, you'll remember, for a fee of £1 million. And he went on the 5th of August, 1991. 
Right. Now, Beardsley was a forward midfield style player. He could play forward, he could play midfield. I think he made Andy Cole at Newcastle. Who did we buy? Can anybody tell me who we spent £1.1 million on instead? Tony Cascarino. Cascarino. Yeah. Right. And Tom Grant tells us this story because he's on the Celtic board at the time. And he tells us this story. And Kevin and I were just standing there absolutely stunned. Um, not with hindsight. Anybody that, that watched football in uh, the summer of 1991 could have told you that Peter Beardsley was the one to go for. But we went for Tony Cascarino. The other two that Tom Grant told us about was, um, first one was Paul McGrath. And there was two opportunities for Celtic to sign Paul McGrath. The first time was under Billy McNeil. And the second time was um, under Liam Brady. Uh, obviously, they had played together with uh, the Republic of Ireland. And Celtic had gone down to, uh, I think it was Manchester, to sign Paul McGrath. Uh, Billy McNeil went, uh, Tom Grant went, and Neely Mocking went. And they were to meet Paul McGrath at a dinner. And Paul, because I don't think it was public at the time, he had a drink problem, he had an alcohol problem, and he got very, very drunk, and he failed to sign. But uh, that, for me, would have been an absolute coup for Celtic. Mm. But the third one that he told us about was Steve Bruce. Now, you remember Steve Bruce went from Norwich to Man United uh, in 1987. So that was the move. It was a 1987 move, and I think it was 750 grand, but we went for Mick McCarthy for half a million. So Tom Tom Grant was telling us some of these things that for Celtic fans, it's just tremendous to hear, or maybe not so tremendous, because you think, what if? Declan, what player, I've mentioned a few there, what player do you uh, look back on and think, oh, I wish you'd signed for Celtic? Um, To avoid the usual Brendan Rodgers chat, I'll... Oh. Just avoid the one that stands out for me in the past um, three <laughs> years. But I, I, another one that um, I remember being linked at the time, there probably wasn't anything in it, but he did move from Manchester City out to Olympiacos. Um, apart from being a fabulous football player, um, obviously we had his brother at the club for a season and he went on to the coaching role and I thought, maybe with Colo just sitting there, could he tempt the big man up um, from City up to Glasgow, even if it was just for a year? Um and that would have been Yaya Toure because I just think, you know, imagine having Colo and Yaya. I know he's probably his better days were behind him, but I think he would have certainly did the business under Brendan Rodgers. Um, it was probably pie in the sky stuff. I also remember in 2012 there was the link. Tony will probably remember that because you might have even covered the story with Del Piero coming to Celtic Park. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I remember he that, opted yeah. for the move to, I think he went to Sydney or somebody out in Australia. Yeah. Um, so... And then the obvious one would be the man that's, you know, the maverick for Scotland at this point in time and John McGinn. Um, I really enjoy when I watch him at Hamden play for Scotland and I just think that had we got him in the door, it would have certainly been a different football side. But um, there's three for you, Paul, that are not bad players, I don't think. I know. David so, Ginola for me. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, he's our Jota, yeah, isn't he? Da David that's what Ginola, I keep saying. Uh, he would have fitted right into a Tommy Van Celtic team mm. because he did what Tommy Burns' Celtic team sorry, aye, he did for Kevin Keegan's Newcastle team what he would have did for Tommy Burns' Celtic team and that, you know, everybody looks back on that Newcastle team eh, that swashbuckling Newcastle side who were just fantastic to watch and you willed them to win that Premiership title that year, you'd know no allegiance to Newcastle, but you just wanted them to win because you wanted you wanted them to win because of the way they played football, and you were pretty gutted the same way Keegan was, but they were just reeled in by a, a cracking Man U team. But uh, that for that alone, I, I would have loved to have seen Ginola because I still maintain that Paris Saint Germain's performance at Celtic Park mm. when they turned them over three nothing. Is one of the best European performances I've seen from a, a visiting team, and they were quite rightly applauded off Celtic Park because even Celtic turned around and went, you know what, you know, fair play. That's how they, we like they, to see the football played. Aye, correct, you know, mm -hmm. and they were outstanding. And that, and if you're of my age, I'm 49. I've watched uh, Real Madrid, Ajax, you know, 
uh, Man U, all sorts of teams, Juventus come, and it's still probably PSG ranks as one of the most complete performances I think I've ever seen from an opposition. And they, they ripped Celtic apart just by, you know, sheer brilliance, you know, and sheer, just the way you look. You, you actually thought, okay, we're getting beat. I'm just going to enjoy this as a spectacle of football. And, and it was, and you, you never enjoy watching Celtic get beat, but some some games are more palatable than others. And that for me was one of the more palatable ones because I just thought I was watching something really, really special. I remember their way leg, Tony. Yeah, they uh, lost one nil, and Van Hooydonk lost the ball in the lights. Yeah. Floodlights, yep, uh, skied it over the bar. And and you felt that Celtic had a chance mm-hmm. coming back to Parkhead. You thought one nil, great result. Oh my goodness, to get blown away, second leg. But yeah, I'd have loved, uh, I'd have loved you know like Celtic Park. I really would have. You know what? We're going to pick up on that subject because it's one of my favourite subjects at the moment, the Ginola and Yota <laughs> duality because Ginola had Les Ferdinand and we've got Yakamakis. So I want to speak <laughs> about that. We will be back after the next show, which is a wee break uh, from proceedings. We've had a few wee pr- breaks where we've, we've put in some pre-produced content. So earlier on today, you will have watched, and if you haven't, Check out the YouTube channel, an interview with Tony Curran, uh, who speaks fondly of Declan McConville, um, as well as other Celtic legends. French to the stars, Declan McConville. Yeah, French to the stars, absolutely. Um, And we've also uh, had an interview that was expertly done by Amy Canavan uh, with Jerry McCabe, who is basically one of these guys who has been involved in Scottish football for so long. Um, He was telling us when he was in the studio that he... Signed for Hibs in 1975-76 and this season was the first time since then that he hasn't done a pre-season with a football club. Astonishing. So he's got loads to tell to tell and uh, he was a close friend of Tommy Burns and he worked under Tommy at the academy. Uh, So he speaks fondly of the late, great Tommy Burns also. One of those that falls into the category of great players and Jerry was a great player to never have one been capped for Scotland or, you know, got that big move, you know, that, that big move, you know, they talk about Chick Charnley as well. Yeah. Jerry yeah. falls into that kid. Jerry was a, a fantastically talented footballer. Mm-hmm. He really was. A, a, and anybody who watched Jerry play for the clubs that he played for will tell you he was head and shoulders above most most players at, at the level that he played at or the clubs that he played at because he, he was a, a superbly gifted footballer and one of those players who would have benefited from getting that big move. You know, he he's very about, self-deprecated about yeah, his talent. Yeah, he uh, He's a very humble guy. Yep. But uh, I thought Jerry McCabe was a, a fantastic footballer. And he almost signed for Celtic. Another one. Another one. Just uh, following on that trend. Well, the next show is going to be an unplugged session. So go uh, and enjoy that on the YouTube channel. Uh, fantastic unplugged session, which involves flutes and accordions. But you will enjoy it, I promise. Um, and we will be back, Tony and I will be back to talk about uh, Ginola, Ferdinand and other Celtic <laughs> topics uh, in about half an hour. So thank you all for your donations. We've smashed through the 16K barrier. Thank you for uh, uh, joining us, Declan McConville and Tony Haggerty on a Celtic State of Mind. <laughs>